object to be recorded, uh, we offer the opportunity to leave the meeting. Uh, mobile phones, uh, if you would switch to silent, uh, and that's that. So I'm uh, Councillor Les Byron, I'm chair of this meeting, and I declare the meeting open. A couple of other things. Um, just to mention, in the uh, Queen's birthday honours list, our own uh, Joe Stevens uh, was awarded the Queen's Fire Service Medal, and uh, I think the whole authority uh, would like to send her our congratulations on, on that recognition and honour. So the next uh, item on the agenda, I believe, hang on, is the um, declarations of interest. If any members have any declarations of interest? Any additional items of business? Nothing. Um, and there's nothing to be excluded. So we can start recording of the meeting from now. Uh, I have minutes of the previous meeting, that's page 7 to 10. Any changes of factual nature to that? If not, is it agreed that I'll sign that? Thank you. I'll come down here a um, The next item is a petition, petitioned item. The petition itself has been uh, placed uh, uh, under our standing orders. Uh, petitioners uh, will have five minutes to present their petition and speak to it. And thereafter, there'll be five minutes of questions, and there's no opportunity for debate. Uh, the petition has been placed by Mr. Brace. Would you be speaking to this? You have five minutes, sir. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, this is the uh, e-petition, which has 14 signatures. There's also a related paper petition with two signatures, but I'm the same lead signatory on both. So although that adds up to 60, it's actually only 15 in total. Uh, the petition asks for two things, basically. Uh, one is the deletion of the bit at the start of the meeting where you ask for objections, partly because uh, there's no power you have anymore to stop filming, and it also asks for a review of the filming policy. A review of the filming policy has actually taken place and came back to the Fire Authority last October, and then it's also on your agenda, I think, item 8, because there need to be some changes to the Constitution following that review. Uh, originally, I was going to present this to the meeting on the 3rd of December 2014, but unfortunately that meeting was brought forward from 1 to 11 because of a royal visit, and uh, I wasn't aware of the change of time. And anyway, I'll just go through briefly what the petition's about, but of course you've got it in front of you so you can read through. Uh, one of the comments that one of the petitioners made was that democracy should be transparent and open, and that I presume they're kind of implying that there shouldn't be anything in, in the way. Uh, the, there have been a few changes to filming policy over the last five years in that uh, one of the things that was changed last October was you said we can only come in 20 minutes before, but I see in the changes later on in the agenda that's got back down to half an hour. Because, of course, when we come to the building, we have to sign in the visitor's book, uh, get our passes, get, possibly get the Wi-Fi password, get a copy of the agenda, and all these things take time. So uh, that was basically the main issue was about time. Uh, the other issue I was going to bring up was in the policy it says that after the meeting's finished or if we get asked to leave because you say the present public have to not stay for the rest of the meeting, then we don't seem to be getting escorted back to the waiting area, which is currently in the policy. Uh, but other than that, uh, it's pretty much in what's being handed out, so I'm not going to read out what you've got in front of you anyway. Does that, is that okay? I haven't used a whole five minutes, but if you've got any questions, I can answer them. If I'm Thank you, Mr. Are there any questions? Okay. So, the answer that I've been given uh, is a legal answer, it's a constitutional answer. Um, standing Order 19.4, uh, in Mr. Grace's petition, claims that the Constitution states that 19.4, no recording, including tape and television recording, of the whole or any part of the proceedings of a meeting may be taken without the express permission of the meeting concerned. Actually, the Constitution says, quote, recordings, tape and video, as well as written recordings of meetings of the authority, its committees and subcommittees, may take place by any citizen subject to A, the Provisional Standing Order 21, that's the Prevention of Disorderly Conduct, B, compliance with provision of Schedule 12A of the Local Government Act 1972, discussion of confidential items, 
and see. And here is the protocol on the reporting of meetings. With that in mind, the protocol on reporting of meetings, the paragraph, the protocol paragraph to which Mr. Brave refers to is as follows. Quote, he or she will then ask attendees whether they agree to be filmed, photographed, and or audio recorded, to allow them to register a personal objection. If anyone has a personal then the chair can temporarily suspend filming, photographing, and or audio recording to allow attendees to have their say. Note this does not apply to members and officers. If the chair considers the filming, photographing, and or audio recording is disrupting anything, he or she can instruct you to stop doing so. Both Standing Order 19.5 and the paragraph of the protocol to which Mr. Brace refers comply fully with the legislation. The reason for temporary suspension of recording is to enable any objections to be made and to allow objectors either to be seated away from cameras or microphones or to leave the meeting. This is in order to protect the public as the legislation does not apply to members or officers. Uh, another part of the protocol has already been amended to make it clear that the recording cannot be stopped permanently. So we move to the main part of the agenda, um, so it's the election of Chair of the Authority. Thank you Chair, can I formally move that Councillor Les Byron be appointed as Chair of the Authority? Thank you. Thank you. Any other nominations? Mm -hmm. I'll declare myself again. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Um, election of Vice Chairs of the Authority. Uh, this year we've uh, decided to revert to the previous position of the Chairs of the two deliberative committees also being Vice Chairs of the Authority. So therefore, I'd like to nominate Councillors Kenny and Councillor Roberts uh, as Vice Chairs of the Authority. Seconded. Thank you. Any other nomination? Thank you. You are elected. Right. Structure of the Authority is item 7. Um, Membership of the authority. So at six is uh, listed, page 11 to 14, is listed the membership of the authority for record. That's just uh, for notice. Is that noted, colleagues? Thank you. Now to seven, structure of the authority. Um, broadly speaking, uh, the proposal is to leave the structure, the family tree, exactly the same. Two deliberative committees. Uh, reporting into the main authority, uh, <laughs> audit committee, scrutiny committee, and then there's a, a group of other small committees um, that really meet on an ad hoc basis. Um, and so the broad proposal, uh, colleagues, is to stay with the uh, current constitutional arrangement, the uh, makeup of the authority and its structure. Would that be agreed? Is there any proposed change? <coughs> Is that agreed, colleagues? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's seven. Uh, the Constitution at, at eight. Uh, now, there's a couple of tracking changes to the Constitution. Yeah, yeah um, just to bring to your attention that the Constitution is broken down into five parts. Part one and two relate to the introduction uh, issues, and there's no substantial changes to report to these parts. Part three, relate to the roles of chairs and members, rights and duties, functions of each committee, the scheme of delegation and terms of reference for the proposed committee. There's been some changes to this part in reference to terms of reference concerned with changes in legislation or already covered by the scheme of delegation, <coughs> delegation along with some changes to the scrutiny committee, which have already been identified in the previous papers. Part four consists of the procedure rules and the, the minor changes to the financial procedure rules, typographical changes to the procedural standing orders, and slight amendments to the exemption procedures in respect of national resilience. 
Part 5 <coughs> consists of the codes and protocols, and I'd like to draw your attention to the officer and member relations protocol and ask and encourage members and officers to read the document carefully. Okay, I mean, this, the constitution is a big, thick document. <coughs> I think when members join the authority, they're either given a version or pointed in the direction of it. Of course, it's on the uh, web site to look at. So, um, if this is approved, the current members will be given the relevant changes to incorporate within their current draft, and new members will be given the full constitution. Sometimes there's a version available in the members room, so if you, know, you want the up-to-date definitive version, <coughs> always come to uh, Democratic Services Legal, and they can give you that. So those are the tracking changes. No major uh, neat uh, alternatives there. Uh, would that be agreed, colleagues? Agreed. So the next is the authority <coughs> meeting dates. Um, they've been circulated with the papers. Uh, there may well be, again, some changes as the year goes by, the usual years with dates added in, meetings, whatever. Uh, again, very helpfully, once this is agreed, we normally have a, a little laminated um, version uh, to put in the uh, bag sort of thing, or on the fridge. Um, uh, so uh, again, that's been circulated. Is that agreed? Agreed. Yeah, so item 10 is members' allowances. This would be for last year, uh, pages 37 to 42. Uh, it's a, a matter for note. Yes? Thank you, Chair. Just a, a point of clarification, uh, which I have raised with officers separately. Uh, on the table on page 41, it does list a claim of £25 for subsistence from me, which uh, was never made. I believe that's been corrected. Okay. Anything else for factual nature? Can that report be agreed? Thank you. So now we come to 11, scheme of allowances for the new, and the year we are now. Uh, as I said at the beginning, there's a proposal to change um, two of the special responsibility allowances for members on scrutiny and to delete those, but to actually revert to the position that we had from last year or so of having the chairs of the two deliberative committees uh, as also vice chairs of the authority lease to just about balance themselves out. Um, and I've uh, sent a note to the treasurer who says that uh, any small difference can be absorbed. <coughs> no problem. So uh, the, the proposal is um, the scheme of members allows stays. Uh, yes, I'll just say broadly the same as last year, uh, with the slight change with regard to vice chairs and the slight change in the deletion of two of the SRAs on, um, on the scrutiny committee. Is that a, do you understand what I'm saying there? Okay, uh, Councillor Rowe. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just a note of um, for information, really, and hope that the authority is agreeable to it. On page 44, item 7, where it talks about um, a special responsibility allowance paid pay to, obviously, just one of the opposition spokespersons. Um, clearly, now there are two Conservative members and two Liberal Democrats, so um, we've just met and decided that we would split that one allowance between us. That was problem, the yeah. first proposal, that's, uh, yes. Any, any views on that? No? So, uh, with those uh, rolling amendments, would that report all be agreed? Thank you very much. Um, so 12, a little bit more complicated, the questions on the discharge of functions. So I'm going to propose uh, for Nosley, Councillor O'Keefe, for Liverpool, Councillor Roberts, Sefton the same, Byron, St Helens, Councillor Preston, and for Wirral, Councillor Kenny. Agreed? Agreed. Appointment to the famous outside bodies. Broadly speaking, the Government Association of Fire Commission. Uh, 
we don't need to be mob handed there, but the chair and vice chairs to go to that. Um, Northwest employers. Um, this is uh, an important organisation. It provides some training to us, uh, which is very useful. And I think uh, whilst uh, um, Council Roberts has indicated his willingness to represent the authority, if any other member would be interested in going on to the um, Northwest Employers, please indicate and we can make the arrangements. But in default of that, Councillor Roberts. Uh, Northwest Fire Advisory Forum. Again, this is basically chair and vice chairs, opposition spokesmen. Um, it's, you know, it's an open house. Um, it's, if you want to attend, I think it'd be interesting to go and see the Regional Fire Control Centre, but once you've been seen it once, you've probably exhausted your interest. Um, Association Metropolitan Fire Authorities will act as the chair of the authority. Uh, local European uh, Issues Forum. We, we question um, membership of this. It's, it seems to be free. I think I'm not free. Nothing's free, is it? It's, I think the subscription is paid by uh, the region. Uh, the, the sort of Mersey travel uh, have picked that up. Uh, there's a question as to membership. You know, a member uh, representing here. I don't think from from my understanding that there's been many, if any, meetings. So again, um, Council Roberts has uh, indicated that in default uh, he will pick that up because uh, he's previously the representative there. But if anybody has a, uh, a burning desire to do that, please let us know. Liverpool City Region, we don't believe that at this point in time that there is a member representation for that. We're looking into the idea and we're just going to ask uh, the City Region LEP they could just provide a little bit more information to us on what it is that they do. Um, Mersey Community Safety Partnership, we discussed this the previous year about whether there should be member level involvement in that, and again we're still exploring that, also exploring the possibility of money, partnership working and so forth, but there's no one to actually nominate for that at this time. So that's um, 13. Uh, with that, unless there's any other comments or questions, would that be agreeable? Uh, 14 approved conferences. Um, we, we go to the LGA conference, chair, vice chairs. If there's any other training, um, if any member has uh, a, a, a training conference that they would be interested in attending, which is of relevance uh, and importance to the authority, just flag it up and certainly not there's no problem. Training is important. We have a sum of budget there. Uh, obviously it must be contained within that. So there's no other than the appointments to the you know visiting the LGA and the LGA conference, the annual conference and so forth. Would that uh, report be agreed? Agreed. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Fifteen, a bit of a historical thing. We haven't taken it up in the past few years. You can conceive of a situation where there's something we want to lobby on, you know, at that national level. So my recommendation is that we leave this here for now, but, but it probably won't be used. Is that okay? Agreed? Thank you, colleagues. So next is 16, very important. Quality, diversity and inclusion action plan. Chief. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> Uh, prepared to this report is to provide members with an update in relation to our Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Action Plan, particularly focusing on the third and fourth quarter, uh, and to update on the Equality, diversity, uh, diversity and Inclusion Objectives for 2018-19 as of the 31st of March 19, and the recommendation that members note the contents of the reports and the inclusion and progress made against the said objectives. Uh, just for newer members' benefit, you know, we introduced an action plan in relation to equality, diversity and inclusion back in 2013 as a way of ensuring that we are able to um, deliver against those objectives across all areas of the service. So they didn't sit in one particular part, it didn't sit in our 
human resources, function of people in organizational development. They were straddled across every part of the organization, recognizing whether we are preparing purchasing kit and equipment. We want to ensure that the kit and the equipment was suitable uh, for all members of our staff to be able to utilize it uh, effectively. And so it was part, part of a, a, an active approach to ensure that quality, diversity, inclusion was embedded across all parts of the organization. Page 76 in the report goes on to detail some of the work that's been done to date around progress against the, the actions contained within the plan, um, recognizing that this is a three-year plan rather than something that will be concluded in the year it took until to 2020. And uh, members will note that we've made progress against all but one of those actions and one action being closed as a result of the <coughs> focus. Um, the report then moves on to pick up some of this kind of specific elements of our work, recognizing you know, our involvement with the faith community, uh, culminating more recently in the event which took place on the pay ahead called Sheer Ramadan, <coughs> Sheer Food and Sheer Friendship. And that's due to the relationship that was struck with the faith networks around the role of the fire service, how we can support them in the delivery of their services, but equally how they can support us and ensure that we are accessing our communities in the most effective and suitable way. Part part of the work we've done over a number of years now is related to a, a program which we call Knowing Our Communities. And that is ensuring that the information that we hold <coughs> on our communities is utilised effectively in the delivery of our plans. So if we have got certain communities, certain faith groups, certain you know, um, religious beliefs, then we would target our resources based on the information that we have. What I would highlight in relation to the knowing our communities element of it is we do extensive amounts of work with uh, partners around um, things like tension monitoring. So we know when some of our communities are coming under a little bit of pressure. Uh, for whatever reason, and there's an example within the report talks about the terror attacks in Christchurch, New Zealand, and how that can manifest itself in our own communities in regards to people's views. What it also recognises that our, or will bring to members' attention, however, is the fact that our fire stations are hit by recording centres, the safe havens, and equally we're now in the process of, of installing defibrillators on the external uh, parts of our stations so they're accessible to the community. What, whether that as a direct equality related matter, what it is, it's saying our community <coughs> fire stations are accessible to our community, particularly our communities where they're coming under pressure. Um, and as I say, we've done some extensive work in how we are able to respond to those tensions as they are growing and developing. Moving on, it talks about our own, our own engagement internally with our staff through our staff networks, the utilisation of Black History Month to, to, to raise some of the kind of issues that staff have in regards to their role that they fulfil for the service and how we can support them to do that. And a real focus for 2019-20 will be on the development and the growth of our, step, our staff networks, particularly around gender and bearing. And then we move on through the report to talk about the ensuring that our staff are equipped to work within our communities. And you know, more recently, uh, we've appointed an equality diversity and inclusion advisor, uh, and that is specifically focused on Objective 4, which we'll come on to in a, in a short while, which is about ensuring that our staff have the right knowledge, skills, and understanding to be able to act effectively in our communities. The report then moves on on page 79, around Appendix 9, 10, 10, to detail how we responded to our quality objectives, which are detailed within the plan. First quality objective being to create a strong and cohesive organisation that are positive to rise into the challenges that we face. And then the report and it goes on the part, part of paragraph 10 to detail um, the makeup of the, of the fire and rescue service and a talk about fire and rescue service in its totality, not simply focused on our operational response or our firefighters, but the organisation as a whole. But it does go on to then detail some of the specifics around uh, roles. And you will see uh, from the report itself that we've seen improvements across all parts of, of, of the service in regards to the diversity um, and increases in, the, in our female firefighters and uh, increasing in our main firefighters too as part, part of our positive action uh, that we've undertaken in regards to our recruitment practice. Quality objective two um, is more around the services that we deliver uh, to the public and ensuring that they are meeting the needs of our diverse communities. One of the primary kind of focuses for us is around our home fire safety checks uh, and ensuring that we are uh, reaching out to all the communities irrespective of, of where individuals live uh, or what the kind of the 
protect the cartridges that they may hold. One thing which I would highlight, and it's, it's kind of picked up a couple of times in the report, but I'll be specific, is some of the consultation that we've been uh, undertaking more recently around our alternative proposals. But part, part of that consultation was actively sought the public's view on whether we would look to, to tackle the, uh, not necessarily a, a, a readily identified protected characteristic as you would know it, but certainly to tackle issues around social economic disadvantage. And there's a real recognition from officers and I'm sure members that there are parts of our communities who are in abject poverty and where we are starting to see smoke alarm ownership diminish. And as a result of that, we've asked the communities uh, through our public consultation whether they would like us to, well, to focus on people who are over 65 because they are most likely to die in fires. A significant number of the fires that we attend that have an impact on our communities are in the most, or in or highest in the top 10 most deprived areas of Merseyside. And whether, you know, in response to that, we would revise our, our home safety strategy to reflect that need in regard to that abject poverty and the reprovision of smoke alarms free of charge to those communities. At this moment in time, and it will be subject to kind of, again, authority approval, at this moment in time, the consultation has given us the indication that that is something that the, uh, the, the public may decide would like to see us uh, focus on. The board carries on to talk about the work that we do around uh, young people particularly, um, and focusing on the Prince of Trust and fire cadet predominantly. But what I draw members' attention to is the breakdown of those attending the Prince of Trust course, um, and under page 81, which probably falls under paragraph 11, it uh, just highlights the point that a further breakdown of the 186 individuals who attended the Prince of Trust programme, 131 were either from the homeless, ex-offenders, asylum seekers, those in care or leaving care, or, and, or part of a homeless household. So again, a real recognition of the role that the Fire and Rescue Service has in tackling some of the real challenges that our communities are facing through our engagement programmes. It goes on to then to talk about our fire cadets and the work that they do in support communities and the fact <coughs> that we've got a, a, a significantly positive breakdown of those who attend. Objective three talks about how we reduce fires in the most vulnerable groups. Uh, just reinforcing that point I made earlier around you know, the, you know, the significant number of fires that occur in the top ten most deprived areas of Merseyside, but equitably for newer members, a real focus on those individuals who are over 65 years of age, live alone, have lifestyle challenges associated with disability and so on, and that is the primary focus for our preventative activity, and hence the reason why you know, we've had two, two successive years you know, below five deaths ever recorded in Merseyside. Objective four, again, reinforces the, the recruitment of and the role of the, uh, the EDNI advisor, which is about ensuring that our staff are equipped to undertake their role and that, that advisor is going out and speaking to all staff across the organisation and indeed will speak to members around the role of, of equality and diversity in the work that we do. And then uh, as we move off of Objective 4, Objective 5 um, reflects our ambition to continue and maintain our excellence in regards to the equality framework and where it continues in regards to benchmark and this service against those of the highest performing around the equality agenda. Uh, and Chair, I'm happy to conclude at that point and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, that's why it's at the AGM, uh, because it's uh, not just a statutory requirement that we <coughs> take up on a personal responsibility for equality and diversity. Uh, we've always taken this responsibility you know, very seriously here in Mersey Society. We like to be amongst the leading authorities when it comes to this issue. Uh, we've added in, uh, in more recent times, the issue of um, stress and mental health of our staff. And you could say that to our you know, clients as well, if you like, people on the other side. Uh, but um, if there are any particular questions you can make. Thank you, Chair. Just referring to the uh, table on page 132, in terms of the greatest declines in the staff surveys, uh, quite significant declines in cultural values in terms of uh, staff thinking this is a, a better place to work than three years ago and also in change management. Are we any feedback on uh, the reasons people are feeling that way? Perhaps this is something we could uh, scrutinise and go to depth, perhaps at the scrutiny committee. 
Thanks, Chair. Um, I suppose in, in relation to the the cat, the cat the focus, no surprises there in, in regards to the way that we are involved in and around you know, our, our culture and showing our culture meets the, the aspirations of the service and therefore the, the needs of our communities. So today I focus for so as we've kind of articulating some of our, our plans. I think from a, a, a sector wide perspective, you know, I think the, the first tranche of inspections have indicated work around the culture is required and particularly a focus around diversity of services. I think with a, a, a fire rescue service which reflects its communities more effectively than it currently does and I include Merseyside in that uh, we are better able to meet those operations and uh, cultural improvements uh, results as, <coughs> as part and parcel of that. Um, so it is work that's in progress in regard to our undertakings and I'm happy to for members to continue to scrutinise that particular area if that's uh, if that's core of the authority. I mean, if the scrutiny committee would like and work plans and uh, that's, a, that's an issue that's going to be a big good idea mm -hmm. but also I think whilst members you know we, we meet with chief officers we interact but we also like to go around fire stations and I think that is a very very useful opportunity to hear literally from the front line and not just the fire stations uh, you know the, 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 the training centre here at headquarters Staff, we had the sort of uh, rapid dating day type of thing where people circulated around. These are good opportunities to talk to our embedded <coughs> staff and ask them what they think about you know, cultural issues as well. Other than to say, if we go back to our own authorities, morale in you know, uh, the public sector is pretty low anyway, uh, and, and that it has to be reflected. Yeah, I don't think it's specifically gender related. Some of, some of the things that, that we do as a, as a fire rescue service, clearly we are predominantly a 365 you know, organisation, albeit we have duty systems which can uh, reflect the demands that are placed on the service. Um, and as a result of that, we you know, require our firefighters to be in relatively frequently. So if you look at the uh, historic duty system, that, that you know, firefighters have been in the service a longer time, we'll be familiar with. System colloquially it means the firefighters would be on you know, during the daytime, so it would be two shifts of a day, followed by two shifts of the night time. Uh, and so it's always been a challenge in relation to how we meet the, um, the impact on our staff in regards to their family friendly working arrangements. Uh, some of the duty systems that were introduced more recently uh, mean firefighters are working during the daytime and not the night time. So they, you, know, you could argue the quality impact assessment suggest that there's a positive impact. I think they have a broad range of duty systems which reflect the needs of the organisation, but also aspire to meet the needs of the individuals is where this organisation is going. So rather than just having a single option, there is a multitude of options for staff to choose um, and to kind of move into duty systems which reflect their needs. Ultimately, you know, we, we need firefighters to be in at the time that we require them to be able to deliver the service that they are required to do on our behalf. We have policies and procedures in place for our family friendly working, which we are able to adapt and adopt in regards to individuals' requirements. So there's probably a number of um, individuals who are working in this organisation who have flexible working arrangements in place to meet their family concerns. And it's not necessarily again just extended to beyond young people and children, it also extends to care and responsibilities too. When we've got policies and procedures which reflect some of the challenges that carers have in this organisation too and our parents with dementia and so on and so forth that they are all taken into consideration and where we can meet an individual's needs and aspirations and it meets the services then we would absolutely embrace that opportunity to provide that flexibility for our members staff. <coughs> Again, some of these changes you, you alluded to which are the new changes you call them, we've got a special meeting uh, coming up to look at uh, the uh, consultation on the IRFP and some of those things may have been included in that consultation, <coughs> uh, which we will come to look at in due course. Any 
any other? Yes. Um, I'm just looking at the uh, gender pay gap. I see there's an 11.7 percent gap at the moment between male and female. I'm just wondering what steps are being taken to try and reduce that gap. I suppose in the first instance, the gap for probably Merseyside relates to um, a historic position. So, in fact, we went back to for 30 years, but when I got recruited, um, the recruit course before me was the first female firefighter moved into the fire rescue service that's back in 1990. Then there's been a, a probably a pretty significant hiatus in regards to recruitment based on aesthetic and challenges in course of the fire rescue service. So rather than growing and continuing to recruit, we've seen the numbers of staff diminish over that period. So we've been unable to change the diversity of the service and certainly the kind of gender differential. So we've got a smaller number of female firefighters than we have uh, male firefighters. But when you put that into the context of an <coughs> organisation, you know, what you find is you know, our firefighters are paid better than some of our support staff. And because there's a differential between we have more male firefighters than we do female firefighters, then it has a disproportionate effect. Um, and so that, that is evidence of why there is a gap there in the first instance. But what I'm just, just so I'm absolutely crystal clear, you know, what we haven't got is a pay differential between a female firefighter and a male firefighter, they pay the exactly the same amount of money. It's a historic position that we've got more male firefighters in this organisation and that results in a gender pay gap. As we start to recruit in the way that we have, and we start to kind of diversify the service in the way that we aspire to, then that, that gender pay gap will diminish. And as you will see from the previous 12 months, it's already diminished by a percentage of points on the basis of a recruiting um, individuals into the service which better reflect our communities. Okay, uh, I mean, uh, one of the advantages would be that we've got three recruit cadres per annum. Uh, and if those recruit cadres are more representative uh, of the community of Merseyside, that's our objective, uh, then that will help with the general issue of uh, trying to flatten uh, the, uh, the profile of the authority. And because we didn't recruit for quite some time, it, it, it um, exacerbated this. In every, in every fire authority in the country, really. Uh, but you know, we, we have a policy to try and get this sorted out. What I would suggest is that the kind of challenge forces are our progression for some of our female firefighters. That's probably the kind of focus for us now and over the next a uh, number of years where really, what we started to do as the chair is quite rightly like said we started to recruit, in, recruit individuals in so we are diversifying the workforce but what we need to do is make sure that our female firefighters see the opportunity to progress in the same way as our male firefighters do so that again will be a real focus for us moving forward seeing our female firefighters progress up the organisation uh, rather than remaining static in a firefighting role and that's no disrespect to firefighters and the role they fulfil but it's about kind of giving our female firefighters So I think that's the end of the agenda, other than to say that Denise Allen has joined us. Uh, and um, uh, if I could also ask, um, uh, it's stay behind. Uh, and uh, if members would stay behind, and we'll do a photograph uh, of the members. Okay.